Good afternoon, good evening, that depends on where you are on this planet. Uh, hello, my name is Oleg Dmitriev and I'm the Academic Supervisor of uh, International News Production uh, Master's Program here at High School of Economics in the heart of Moscow. And that's really the heart of Moscow because it's like 10 minutes walk, uh, 10 minutes walk from Kremlin. And today with me uh, is uh, my friend and colleague and co-teacher, uh, Sean Michael Thomas, Sean, uh, f just for short, if you want to address him. Uh, yeah, Sean is uh, an anchor and uh, uh, a reporter with dozens of years of experience, and uh, Sean is working for RT International Television Channel. Nice to have you, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, so you'll have a chance to, uh, to communicate with Sean a little bit later on, but first I would like to tell you what the international news production program is all about. Uh, so just uh, I'll ask my colleague to share, uh, to share the presentation. Uh, so we are just um, uh, brand new. Uh, and um, the um, uh, topic of 
our program, uh, the main goal for our program is to uh, just teach all the innovative approaches to the news. Because in Russia, there are some uh, really good um, news, uh, uh, news, cha uh, news channels, news agencies that broadcast in English, RT and Sputnik are in my, uh, uh, are uh, are uh, among them. So um, just uh, r r really, the thing is that um, uh, th we decided last year with my uh, co-partner Alexei Nikolov, who is the managing director of RT, to give a, each a person an opportunity to study in Russia in English, just to accumulate the. Uh, alternative approach to the world news. And we'll be teaching everything. We'll be traditional approaches to the world news. We'll be teaching uh, Russian approaches to the world news, international approach to the world news, and not just world news. We'll teach a lot about new media. So, uh, and the biggest secret of the program is that you don't have to be a media professional to study with us. We are welcoming uh, bachelors with all the degrees. So no matter who you are, we'll teach you the news and you can be an architect, you can be um, a banker, you can be a, uh, a specialist in construction. So if you are interested in the news and the way they are made, so that is the place to go. So please come to us. And uh, uh, during the broadcast, you will see the name of the uh, internet address, internet link, where you can address to find out all the uh, features of our program. So what do we teach? All the teachings, uh, all the uh, subjects will be in English. So fluent English is a must for our program. And uh, the curriculum spans over two years, during which you'll have to, uh, some theoretical disciplines, some innovation disciplines like 360 camera work, um, uh, just data journalism, something which is also on the rise. You'll have traditional filming, editing, news planning for uh, both for news agencies, for television stations, for radio, podcasts making. So all the major uh, qualities and qualifications that are required for the job of the journalist. Uh, so what else? Uh, just some of the uh, subjects that you need to consider. Philosophy of media communication, news markets and agenda setting, data journalism, with lots and lots of practice. And uh, the trendy part is uh, the video production for traditional and um, uh, uh, video production for news me media, because there will be some anchors that will be teaching you not just to work uh, as a broadcaster, but they'll give you lots of modern tips, uh, uh, lots of modern tips to uh, try to make your own blog, your, may, uh, your own Instagram account, and uh, so on uh, and so forth. So that would be the trendy part. Uh, so, uh, and between the first and the second year, everybody will have a chance to practice in one of the international newsrooms, not just necessarily in Russia. Uh, so, yeah, that uh, sounds like fun to me. Uh, so, um, uh, and uh, I hope that will be uh, also useful to you. So you can ask all your questions at the address that will be shown, uh, just um, that will be shown uh, later on during the broadcast. Uh, all right. Uh, so now uh, over to Sean. And Sean is uh, one of the teachers who uh, is doing his best to train students in the field of reporting. Indeed. Uh, so uh, just uh, you had uh, several chances to work with the students. Indeed. What are your own impressions to the program? So why are there any, uh, is, is there something that might worth considering from the part of the teacher? Well, I believe that uh, it certainly is an interesting uh, program. Uh, the students that I've worked with are uh, have a diverse background. They have a diverse um, level of interest and level of experience. We've worked with uh, some journalists who are really experienced in the field and um, come to the program with a level of professionalism and expertise, and they're just looking to continue their education. Uh, we also have uh, worked with students who have no experience whatsoever in journalism and just came to 
this program with an idea to learn and set foot into this industry. So from a teaching standpoint, uh, I, I've had fun learning as well from the students, uh, the different perspectives, the different uh, areas of expertise. And uh, it's just been fun to give them my knowledge and also learn from them. And it's uh, less of a formal uh, professor-student relationship as much as it is a conversation. And I like that aspect, that kind of a newer uh, free style aspect as well. So what is uh, precious in the media right now from your experience, from your point of view? Um, in terms of uh, what a new journalist needs to know in the media? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I, when I first started in the industry, it was uh, pretty set for, straightforward. Uh, you came in, you had a story that you were assigned to, you learned about that topic, you went out and got your interviews, you put together your stories, your packages, and uh, a package is uh, industry terminology for a story. That's what we would actually call a full story that you put together on television news. Um, sometimes you would have a live, and that was it. You did your job, you came in, you did your story, you did your lives, and you went home. Now, it's really interesting because it's not just about doing your story and getting the job done. It's 100% of your time, 100% of your life. So uh, with all of the new media that we have out there, with uh, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok even, Facebook, um, a journalist now has to be skilled in all of these areas in order to tell the full story, um, both in terms of getting information and giving information. So uh, let's say I'm assigned a story about something that's happening in Moscow. The first thing I'm going to go to is Twitter. So I'm going to try and find out if there's any information that I can learn about what's happening on Twitter. And then I have to know what information is usable and what information is non-usable. Uh, because one of the amazing things about Twitter is that everybody has access to it and everybody can provide information. One of the negative aspects about Twitter is that everybody has a, a access to it and everybody can provide information. Mm -hmm. So how to tell truth from the lies? Exactly. If you're a lawyer, so that's the biggest question. Yeah. So one million dollar question, right? It is the one million dollar question. So, but that's one thing that we have to figure out. And um, I will say that um, when you check something on Twitter, one of the most um, standard rules of journalism is if you hear some information, you have to fact check that information. Uh, and so you read it on Twitter, you fact check it, you get a second source, you always get a second source or a third source or fourth mm -hmm. source. My, um, yeah, tell a phrase that all <laughs> the students remember, all the students of the program really do remember that phrase. Really? That, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that if your mother tells you that uh, she loves you, get a second opinion or get a second <laughs> source of information. Um, and my brother always... Uh, uses that one on me. He's like, oh, she says she loves you, but can you really believe that or not? You're going to have to get a second source. Um, so yeah, so uh, Twitter, they, uh, you, you find out some information, you fact check it, you cross check it with other facts, and pretty soon you get to, to get good at finding out what's reliable, who's reliable, what's nonsense, what's absolute uh, propaganda, and um, but then, once you have that information, you go into the story already with, um, with a foundation of knowledge that you wouldn't have had uh, 10, 15 years before. Mm -hmm. So what's your personal experience? You were not initially a journalist, as so far as I can remember, right? <laughs> right. And uh, I was not a journalist either, so right. I was a, a translator and a teacher of the foreign languages. Right. And uh, what was your background? Because not many people come to news have journalistic background right away. Right. So this is something to remember. If you choose us, you all will be able to retain your profession and to be professional in the news. What's your background, John? Um, well, interesting. I uh, have a music, theater, and arts background, uh, and I went to the Interlochen Arts Academy in Michigan. And you know, I was going to be an actor, right? Because this is this was going to be my career path. Um, and when I uh, left university, 
I got a, um, a job in radio broadcasting, uh, doing kind of funny voices and characters for, for commercials, but also just as a music DJ. And one day, I was coming home, and I lived near this big factory. And the entire factory was on fire, or the fire was just starting. So I contacted, as a good employee should, uh, my work, and I said, hey, guys, uh, this factory, Swain Robinson, is on fire. You're going to have to send the news team. This is a really big news story. And they said, we don't have anyone to send. You're going to have to do the job for us. And I was like, I don't know how to be a reporter, but I could act like I was a reporter because, um, you know, my, my theater training, right? So I went to, to the police chief, and I got the information. And then I went to the fire chief, and I got information. And I uh, talked to witnesses to get information. And then I would use that information, and I would scribble down notes, and I would tell the story, um, because that's one thing that journalists really are. If you really get down to the heart of it, journalists are storytellers. Um, the stories that they're telling are about real life and what's happening in the news, right? Uh, but you have to be able to put all of the pieces together in a, into a story that makes sense for the listener or for the viewer, uh, and that's where, you, that's where you hone your skills. That's where you get good at what you do. So this factory on fire ended up being such a big story that CNN was interested in it, and all of the different television stations from uh, around the surrounding areas were interested in it, and so I ended up doing live shots for them and doing phone interviews for, for different places. And get, I was the one reporter mm -hmm. on the scene, which is funny because I wasn't a reporter at all until the very next day when I went back into work and they said, okay, we're uh, moving you from being just a regular music DJ to actually being in the news department. And so that's how I got my start. So what can you advise uh, modern students, uh, those who consider... Um, joining us, but who are shy because, well, many people do not uh, know how to tell stories on camera, how to stay, tell stories when you look at the camera, how to tell them when millions of people are looking at you. So what can you recommend uh, just for them to overcome this barrier? Interesting question, and my answer is going to seem a little bit rude, um, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, in the United States, there was a legendary journalist named Mike Wallace. Uh, actually, his son, Chris Wallace, is a journalist on Fox News now and is really respected in his own right. However, Mike Wallace was one of the founding members of uh, 60 Minutes on CBS and had an extraordinary career uh, spanning decades. And really one of the pioneers of television journalism. And I had the opportunity when I was teaching radio broadcasting uh, at Interlochen Center for the Arts, uh, I had a student who asked that question. He said, I, I really get nervous um, when I open the microphone. I, and I, I just really don't know, what, and I don't know what to do. And Mike Wallace interrupted the student and said, how dare you? How dare you be nervous? If you're nervous, it means you're thinking about yourself. And no one tunes into the news to... Um, to watch you, really they don't. Like I don't tune into the news to watch a specific anchor. I tune into the news to get information. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. if you're not nervous, that means you're dead. <laughs> True, no, no, there, 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 is a, there is a level of um, n nervousness that has to kind of fill in. But if you really think about this in terms of uh, the people you're talking about are going through the worst situations in their lives. You're talking about death, famine, war, destruction. Uh, the overthrow of governments. You're talking about financial collapse. You're talking about where people might not know where they're getting their next meal, where they're getting clean water. Um, you have an obligation to give this information to people so that they can know what to do with their lives. Compared to them, you're just sitting, talking, and giving information. You're in a pretty good place. Um, of course, you know, if you're a war correspondent, that's a whole different story where you're actually in the situation with them. Of course, you can be nervous. You can be scared for your life. Um, but you still have an obligation to tell the truth and to get that information to people who need that information. So uh, it's not about you. It's about the story. So the way out is to 
learn to how to tell stories, right? Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so if you, and, and the, the flip side of that is if you know the information, if you, if you know the story, if you know the information, if you know what you're talking about, then really there's no reason to be nervous as well. When was the last time you were nervous brushing your teeth? You weren't because you know how to brush your teeth and you know why it's important and you know that it's just something that needs to be done, right? So if you are telling a story about, let's say, uh, the political situation in Myanmar, if you are familiar with the political players in Myanmar, if you're familiar with who the leaders are, who the players are, what the story is, what the information is, what the latest is, then even if you don't have a map of, of what you're going to be talking about, you're prepared for any question that comes your way, and you're prepared to tell the story in a way that makes sense. So again, no reason to be nervous. Sean, uh, people who are watching us uh, uh, come from different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I know where I watched in China, in Singapore, uh, yeah, in um, Bangladesh, in Malaysia, in Iran, and in Central Asian republics of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. For those and in Malaysia and Singapore, apa kabar? Uh, just basically, <laughs> kagdila, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the question to you is, mm -hmm. you've been in Russia for more than 10 years. Yes, about 12 years. How, uh, yeah, about 12 years. How was that for um, a person from outside country to live here for so long and to fall in love with the country? Because that, the answer to that question might be useful to our international applicants who are kind of excited to come to Russia, but they uh, like to know more about it. Right. Um, Russia is a fascinating place. Absolutely fascinating. It has a rich culture, rich heritage, um, history. Um, the arts here are incredible. And the average citizen has an above average knowledge of the arts and culture and can have a conversation about literature and about music. And so, um, so I would say come here with an open mind. Uh, it's it seems, and moving anywhere for the first time, it, it seems scary. But um, there's this stereotype about Russians that they're very closed and um, serious. Very harsh. Very harsh Russians people. like me, yeah. yeah. I am serious. Yeah, of course. I have to be course. serious. I'm the academic supervisor <laughs> of the program. Yeah. Yes, and, 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 you know, and for the real truth on that story, you can contact me later. Um, <laughs> but uh, here's what I will tell you about Russians. When you first meet them, it is true. They, they they don't smile, and on the subway it can seem very... Like this. <laughs> right. But once you get past that um, initial barrier, and once you gain the trust of someone from Russia, uh, they're the kindest, open, uh, very funny, extremely funny uh, group of people with an amazing sense of humor. I guess with the cold, harsh winters, you've had to have uh, cultivated a good sense of humor. Um, but they will also give you the shirt off their backs if it means that um, they're being hospitable. Um, I know I've been in some homes of some Russians uh, where they will put on a feast and give you the best portions of everything and sacrifice for themselves just to make sure that you have had a good experience here. And that's what I found out about Russia generally, is that people are kind, friendly, and open once you get past that first initial impression. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any interesting stories as a reporter that you have in Russia? So, something that taught you a lot? Um, every story actually teaches you something, um, if, if that makes sense. But one of my most uh, cherished experiences um, was up in the Nenets Avtomatomny Okrug. I, I get that wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, so we went up to this uh, city of Narianmar. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's Nenetsky. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's close. Yeah. Um, and we were doing a story on reindeer herders, uh, who are a nomadic group of people who literally follow the reindeer around, and they use the reindeer to live off of. They. Um, uh, eat off the meat, they sell the meat, the, the, the reindeer hides, and it's, it's a, an incredible, incredibly fascinating way of life. But they're literally f nomadic following the reindeer around the tundra. And we showed up in a helicopter, uh, and each 
winter or just before winter sets in, uh, the government sends out helicopters and they pick up the children. And up until the age of 13, I believe, the children are required to learn uh, traditional schooling and during the winter. And then in the summers, they, are, they live with their family. So we went out into the tundra um, as they were picking up these children, and they left us there for, for about what was supposed to be about 30 minutes, and then there was a storm system that was starting to move in, so we actually ended up staying quite a bit longer than we were, were supposed to. Um, and here I am, this American, uh, and I'd only been in Russia for maybe a couple months at this time, um, in the tundra of the Arctic North, um, in September, and so it's already really cold up there. And I'm playing literally reindeer games with children who um, have been doing this their entire lives, and they have this, this, one, um, this one game where they throw a lasso over the, the rung of a sled. And if you miss, then everyone who's playing gets to flick you on the head. Um, and so the incentive is, is that the next time you won't miss, right? You'll get better and better and better each time. Well, they've been playing their entire lives, and this is my first time trying to play. Of course, I, I, I probably still have a welt in the, in the place where I've, I've been flicked so many times. Um, but getting to spend time in, in the chum uh, with the family and eat with the family and uh, laugh, and uh, it was one of those experiences where you learn that people are people, regardless of what your background is, regardless of what your education is. Um, an American journalist for new to Russia with uh, a Nanets um, indigenous people's uh, family having an amazing time together, and it, it was just fascinating. It was, it was one of my special memories. That's what the journalism is all about, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, so let's move to another part of the world, because um, I have the story to show uh, everyone, but would you like to tell anything uh, before the story about Antarctica, about penguins, so that just uh, they could know the background? So yeah. we'll tell this afterwards. Certainly. Um, when it comes to uh, the Antarctica trip, um, we... The reason I went in the first place is because there was uh, a lot of stories in the news about um, the Arctic, and there was fighting between Russia and Canada and the United States and the Arctic countries um, over who has rights to operate in the Arctic and who should drill in the Arctic. And um, Anyway, there, there was a lot of negativity surrounding what was happening um, in the Arctic, specifically blaming Russia for a lot of uh, things. And this, this mm -hmm. happens a lot in the news, is that Russia gets blamed. Yeah, but what about Antarctica? Yeah. yeah, well, it starts in the Arctic. So I went to my boss, uh, with, and I pitched this idea that we should go down to Antarctica. Because while there's all this fighting and negativity over what's happening in the Arctic, um, Antarctica is built on cooperation. And Antarctica is uh, for decades has revolved around uh, all of the nations who operate down there working in harmony and cooperation and with scientific research as the main goal and not commercializing the area. And so there's many treaties in place that, that govern how Antarctica is. So I said, send me to Antarctica. Why? Because I really, I just wanted to go to Antarctica and play with the penguins. But I had a newsworthy reason to go, and uh, ended up being there for quite a bit of time, um, embedded with the uh, Antarctic explorers from Russia, living at the Bellingshausen Station. Uh, did uh, met presidents of Chile and Ecuador while I was down there. Um, had diplomatic meetings with the uh, Uruguay Station. Um, had what amounted to a diplomatic uh, dinner uh, with the Chinese station as well. Um, and one of the fun stories that we got to do was about the wildlife down there and um, about the penguins. And uh, it'll, it's self-explanatory in the, the piece that I, if it's the one that I think you're going to play. Um, there's this myth, or is it a myth, that when penguins, um, when a plane flies over, the penguins look up to see the plane and then they fall back on their backs and then they can't get back up. And so there's this um, 
widely believed idea that there's someone who, it's their job in Antarctica to go and flip the penguins right side up. So I decided, why not do an investigative, a deep hitting investigative piece on that? Mm -hmm. So let's uh, uh, try to watch the video right now, yeah, and uh, um, I'll ask the colleagues to bring it on. Our team traveled to the Earth's southernmost continent to meet its black and white locals and explore their lifestyle. One of the claims suggests penguins flip over to the sound of passing planes. The RT Sean Thomas went to separate the truth from the myths. The penguins of Antarctica, truly fascinating creatures to watch. But are they in trouble from a man-made threat? Back in 1982, British pilots in the Falklands discovered a phenomenon as they flew over penguin colonies. They said the birds would topple over as they lifted their heads to watch the planes fly by. Then penguins by the thousands were left on their backs, unable to right themselves. But is this story true? Well, I think it's uh, something that's widely known amongst the public, but I think generally regarded amongst anyone that knows anything about it as being a bit of a myth, to be honest. Uh, an Antarctic Falkland Isles myth. <laughs> As for the second part of the tale, a special person had to be employed to turn the birds right side up after they fell, otherwise they would die. One German ornithologist we spoke to claimed that this indeed was her job. Well, it's my job to look for penguins and go out every day to uh, see whether they fall over and I need to get them up again. And um, so sometimes it can be quite hard because they don't like it very much, but yeah, it can be quite rewarding. Thank you very much. A further look into Anka's credentials left some doubt, as well as a check with the chief of Russia's Bellingshausen Station, a base located in a unique place between an airstrip and a penguin colony. No, no, we don't have anyone who does that job here. With all of the controversy surrounding this rumor, we decided to go to the source itself to see what they had to say about the airplane myth. Unfortunately, the penguins were remaining silent on the topic, but careful observation revealed that sometimes the penguins appeared to have special dances. In a hurry, they could be clumsy and often slipped. And we even found evidence that they were highly intelligent and divisive creatures. Penguins are actually very smart birds. Sometimes when they come to the edge of the ice, you see them peeking over, looking for leopard seals. If one gets too close to the edge, another penguin will push him in as a sacrifice to test the waters. Snopes.com, an internet myth-busting site, says that a British science team actually did research to see if the claims were true. They found that the penguins only scattered from the noise of the airplanes and not one single penguin had toppled backwards. But with no real evidence for ourselves, we decided to do a final test with a little help from the Chilean Air Force. Our mission? To see if we could put this myth to rest once and for all. And it seems, for now, the penguins are safe and no one should be moving south for jobs that just don't exist. In Antarctica, Sean Thomas, RT. Oops. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, just uh, if there were problems in broadcasting of this uh, video, but uh, most of this was broadcast. So uh, I'll make a copy. I'll make the link on the... Uh, in the messages of the broadcast, so you could see this video uh, as well. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So just if you have questions to Sean, if you have something to comment upon, uh, just please feel free to uh, include this into the broadcast. And uh, one more question: mm -hmm. uh, We've seen the report. We've seen the stand-up. How you talk to the penguins. Mm -hmm. We've uh, heard a lot of natural sound from Antarctica. We've heard your voice. How to master all that, because we were talking about telling the story. Mm -hmm. How to show this story to everybody, uh, uh, how to show this story to everybody else, and what can a person learn from our program, from your classes in particular? Right. Um, well, practice, 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 of course. Uh, no one is going to be good at um, putting something together right away, immediately. Um, the good news is, is with the new generations, with uh, TikTok and, um, and Instagram and different uh, variations, people already have a little bit of practice in telling stories in editing um, these days. And, and the concepts are really very similar. 
So um, uh, basically you have, have to be a good writer. Uh, and so practice your writing skills. And what I mean by that is um, if you think you're really good at writing, keep practicing and keep trying and keep practicing and keep honing those skills because the one thing that writing does is it teaches you to organize your thoughts in a way uh, that makes sense and uh, which is a skill that you really have to have. So, um, but the elements that you have in telling a story for television is you have what is known as your A role. So this is your information. So when you go out and you do an interview um, and you use these little clips uh, from your interview, these sound bites, you organize them in a way that tells a story. Um, and the first thing that you're going to learn in order to tell a story for television is how to put your A role together to tell a story that makes sense. And there are specific formulas that you can use that can help you when you're first starting out. And once you've mastered this skill of, of the formula, then you can start breaking away from the formula in order to be more creative in telling your story. So what I would say is the formula includes an introduction and then a sound bite, and then a clip from you, which is connecting to another sound bite, mm -hmm. and then maybe another clip from you, which is connecting to another sound bite, and then a stand-up where you are actually in vision, in camera, which is basically another clip from you, which introduces to another sound bite. So your sound bites are the people who are in the story telling the story. And the only time that you're heard is you're connecting the dots. So that's your A roll. Once you lay your A roll down, that's fine. The next part is the B roll. And the B roll are the visual elements that go hand in hand with the story as it's being told to help tell the story. And what I tell um, my students is that if you watch a story and you only see um, the story without any sound, you should be able to know exactly what's happening in that story. You should be able to tell exactly what that story is about and why that story is being told. And it should make sense. And then if you listen to the story without any video, you should be able to understand why that story makes sense. But when you put the two together, it is absolutely magical because you have the video, which is helping the people tell the story, which is helping the video, which is helping, the, so it becomes this beautiful thing. And then you also have this uh, third element, which you um, mentioned, which is natural sound. Uh, natural sound can be a beautiful thing. If you're talking about an airplane, and then you have the sound of that airplane flying over, you can actually just open up the microphone, listen to that sound of that plane, the plane as it's flying over, and it automatically takes the viewer into a place where they can experience that themselves. And then you reference that in, in the way you tell the story. So you can use natural sound as, um, as a way of, not just in television, it's, it's almost the most necessary item when you're talking about radio. Uh, but when you put your A roll, your B roll, your video, your storytelling, and your natural sound all together, um, you can come up with some amazing masterpieces. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, why is it fun? <laughs> <Is> it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I get to go to the most amazing and interesting places on earth when they are at their most amazing and interesting. Um, I get to meet people from all over the world uh, and hear their stories and help share their stories so that um, people can get information and learn from them as well. So if you like people, if you like travel, if you like um, learning, if you like being in uh, the world in a way that makes a difference, then this is a great career path for you. So that, that, that's fun. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. blast, I would say. Uh, what other pieces of knowledge should you possess before you join the program, before you, so you, you study media? Because, well, sometimes people uh, come to us and say, well, I don't like news, but I like just 
cultural news, right. news about culture, status, and so on. So uh, just what, uh, what really, uh, what is really important here? Um, in terms of what you should know, specifically for this program, I would say um, uh, know how to write and know English. Mm -hmm. um, those, those are the, basically the two uh, key elements for, for this program. Um, those are the things that you need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest are terms of, um, they're not necessarily skills, but you have to be curious. Um, you have to want to know why. You have to want to ask the questions. Uh, as we say at RT, uh, question more, right? Mm -hmm. Why do we say that? Because only through questioning more are you going to really get down to the heart and to the, to the real information. Um, curiosity is vital to this uh, to this work because, in essence, um, when you're telling a story, you, you, you yourself are learning as well along with the audience. So the questions that you're going to ask are the same questions that, uh, that the viewer is going to want to know. Um, an open mind. Uh, I know these, are, these aren't things that you have to know. These are just traits that I think that, that are important. Um, an open mind because... Uh, when you walk into a story and you think you already know all of the answers, that's when you're going to be the most shocked and find out that you really you know nothing at all. And so you can't walk into any story with a preconceived idea of what that story is going to be. You have to have an open mind and learn because um, you're going to surprise yourself every single time you go out there to learn something. You're, um, so curiosity, an open mind, um, and, and a love for the truth. I think those are the things that, that you need to have. Uh, another thing uh, to know is uh, um, the fact that uh, the profession is stressful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even now, just when we are talking, mm -hmm. yeah, we are still going live, and yeah. uh, there are some technical elements in the broadcast, and this is uh, also um, a test for us to be live, yeah? yeah. How to cope with the stress and uh, how to uh, still enjoy the profession when everybody is shouting in the newsroom. Because I have an exercise for professional journalists mm -hmm. when they are supposed to write the text, when the music is turned on to the maximum, you know? And this is what happens when, some, uh, when God forbid, when the planes fall down, mm -hmm. where um, um, coups happen or something like this. This is these are the conditions that we are writing our texts. Yeah. So how to cope with all this? Um, I, I know many joking answers, but I won't go there. Um, the, the the truth is, um, you have to have a balance between, um, you know, taking care of yourself and uh, doing the job. The job can be incredibly stressful. Uh, if you're in the field in a, in a war zone, um, I've literally had to write pieces and do um, pieces to camera and live shots in the most horrific conditions. Um, and so you really do have to practice self-care. Make sure that you get enough sleep. Make sure that you're eating properly. Make sure that you're um, talking with uh, the people who you need to talk with to make sure that like, if you need to vent at the end of the day, make sure that you vent. Um, but also, and that, that's in the field, but in the newsroom itself, newsrooms can be some of the most harsh environments. Um, everybody's yelling at each other. Everybody disagrees. You're coming up against deadlines. Um, and some people love it and thrive off of that, and then other people just don't know how to fully handle the situation. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what I think you'll find is there's so much to be said about a job well done, about getting the job done, and all of the things that are said in a newsroom, uh, back and forth, as harsh and evil as they, they, they may sound when your news editor is yelling at you because you're, you haven't gotten in on time and, um, and you have disagreements as to what elements of the story should be going. At the end of the day, you're all in it for the same reasons. And what I found is that the camaraderie that happens in a newsroom, even under the most uh, stressful of environments, 
brings people together. And at the end of the day, you give each other a hug, and what happens in the newsroom that day is left, uh, left on the floor, and people don't hug, hold grudges. And um, I think the people in news are very supportive of each other because we all know that this is the environment that we work in. We all have the same, we all have the same issues, so we all support each other in the end. Maybe a little bit uh, advertising question, but still. Yeah. Why would you come and study in Russia if you were the teenager, if you were the bachelor in some other country? Why would you come to Russia to study international news? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, it, if you're male, the Russian women are absolutely the most beautiful in the, on the planet. Um, but, you know, I, I'll say this. Um, It's easy to stay where you're comfortable. It's easy to, um, uh, to not break your routine. It's easy to stay in a world that you know. Um, but that makes for an incredibly boring life and an incredibly easy life. If you want to challenge yourself, if you want to um, make your life more interesting, if you want to make yourself more, more cultured, um, then step out of that easy box. Push yourself, challenge yourself. Um, you'll be surprised at what you find out there in this world. And not just Russia. Of course, Russia will be a first step. And then what's beyond Russia? You'll say, hey, wait, that wasn't so bad. What's another place where I can push myself? How can I make myself more interesting? How can I, um, how can I do better? How can I challenge myself more? And the more you challenge yourself and the more you push yourself out of your comfort zone, that's where you're going to find real growth in life. Mm -hmm. So just what can you recommend uh, to read, to find out, to watch before coming to Russia to study international news? Okay. Um, get really good at being in the cold. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm jo you know, the funny thing is that uh, <laughs> winter is coming, that, that famous phrase from the Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. uh, the people who came up with that phrase probably were thinking about Russia uh, in mind. Or, or, at the very least, they had no idea that, you know, winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Russian winter is coming. No, um, but the Russian winter is not that bad. I mean, well, today it's actually winter, yeah, but yeah. we have like plus minus yeah, uh, today, two degrees. I, yeah, it's it, uh, warm and sunny in Moscow. Yeah, It's a beautiful day out there. Um, But uh, what, what should you watch? Um, okay, so there's, there's a book called uh, The Phantom Toll Booth, and it's actually for children. Um, but The Phantom Toll Booth talks about the land of expectations. And the land of expectations is a place that everybody goes in their mind before they get to where they're going, if that makes any sense. And, and to put it in a different way, If you're going to someplace new, if you're going to try something, or if, 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 whether it's a restaurant or if you're going to go visit the parents of a girlfriend, who knows? In your mind, you always have an image of what that is before you actually get there. It's your land of expectations. What I would say is to check all of your expectations because Russia is not what you expect. It will surprise you in so many ways. In terms of, in a great way, in an amazing way. Um, and what I would say, you know, try and learn a little bit of the language before you come. Um, it's going to be incredibly difficult. Uh, no matter what you think you've learned before you get here, you're going to learn that it's absolutely wrong by the time that you get here <laughs> because the Russian language is incredibly difficult. Um, oh, well, but you still master some of the Russian. I, 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 do, Russian. I do know some Russian, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of sentences just for uh, people in China to make sure uh, that it's easy. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Шон. Я родился в Джакарте, Индонезия, но сейчас я живу в России. Все хорошо, все в порядке. Yeah, hi, my name is Sean. I was born in Jakarta, Indonesia, but now I'm living in Russia, and everything mm -hmm. is uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That was a simultaneous translation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean, for sharing the expertise. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I do hope the students, the applicants will like us yeah. and uh, jo uh, join us. So yeah. uh, there might be questions that they, uh, but they will be coming later on the Certainly email. They, uh, yeah. send, send me, uh, if people have questions, you can send them to me and I'd be happy to write out some answers as well. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, for those of you who are in Singapore, my brother was born in Singapore. Uh, those of you who are uh, from Malaysia, um, born in Indonesia, so we have uh, something in common there, at least a little bit of the language. And for those of you in Iran, it's my lifelong dream to go to Iran because of the culture and the, the people and the food. It's so beautiful. So uh, come, come to Russia so that we can talk about all these wonderful things. Uh, yeah, and um, I'm welcoming everybody to Russia as uh, a, a place to start international journalism. Hope you like uh, the uh, meeting with Sean. Uh, hope you like me and Sean, and uh, uh, there will be some other teachers who will be participating in this video broadcast as well. Uh, so uh, just please uh, feel free to ask questions, and also visit um, our website if you dial um, uh, HSE, International News Production, and that is the address that you should dial. Uh, when you are addressing the program, all the conditions, all the conditions for the application, all the rules are listed there. So feel free to contact this page and ask us as many questions as possible. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Goodbye from Moscow, and please stay healthy and take care. Goodbye.